Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast is all about our journey into the woods of ourselves, getting to know who we are, where we are, and where we're going in life so that we can create the life that we want to live. It's about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. It's also about mindset. Our beliefs are such an important part of this journey, and there are so many ways for us to change our mindset so that we can more easily live a life of expansive joy. This podcast is also about going literally into the woods and spending time in nature, and how that can help us on our own personal journey of self-knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now let's get into this week's episode. Hello, adventurers, and welcome to the Into the Woods podcast, episode 498. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another exciting guest. Today, I'm talking with Susan Jagannath. Susan has been a guest before on the show. You may know her from episode 391, where we talked about hiking the Valley of Flowers in the Himalayas, or episode 403, where we talked about adventures on the Camino Inglés. She's back talking about a dream that she had for 40 years that she finally fulfilled. This is another Himalayan adventure. And I love the fact that this was a dream for so long and she did it. I think so many of us have dreams of having certain adventures or traveling to certain places or doing certain things. And we think, oh, well, I'll never be able to do that. That's not necessarily true. Sometimes it just takes a few decades to make it happen, but it's possible. So one of the things I love about Susan and her adventures is that she talks and writes about lesser known places and routes. So I get to learn about new adventures. I really hope you find this episode inspiring. Susan is such a great example of someone who dreamt of a very specific adventure and made it happen. So who is Susan Jagannath? Susan successfully combined a passion for reading, a love of writing, and a fascination for technology to create a career in technical writing. With over 60 technical manuals, not to her name, she finally decided to use her writing and publishing skills for herself and publish her own books independently. To her mild surprise, her very niche books went bestseller regularly, and that's when she realized she had a system that she could help others write and publish as well. As an army brat and then military wife, Her life included seven different schools, three universities, and a couple of emergency evacuations from conflict zones. Travel and adventure were a normal part of life. She now believes in seizing every opportunity to have a new adventure, especially post-pandemic. Whether it's camping on the beach in Australia, trekking in the Himalayas, kayaking in Queensland, whitewater rafting down the Ganges, or walking the Camino in Spain, her philosophy is to pack it into one or two weeks to create memories for a lifetime and to disconnect from television and computer games. Susan is now on the next adventure of her life, traveling post-pandemic, helping corporate escapees write their first bestseller and learning to be an awesome grandmother. So what are you going to learn on this week's episode? We discuss her book, Chasing Himalayan Dreams, which involves a part of the Himalayas that you might not be familiar with. There's a mountain called Kanchenjunga that she hikes a loop around. And it's really high altitude. It's just, it sounds beautiful. So it's a trip that requires a lot of planning. It's not the kind of thing you can just turn up to and just go. You need a local guide. We learn about all the logistics of the trip, how to organize it, what's it like, what do you see, top tips for someone who wants to visit this area. And finally, did the reality fulfill Susan's expectations? I know a lot of times we can have a dream for so long and then when we finally do it, it may or may not fulfill our expectations. So without further ado, here is this week's episode. Hello, Susan. How are you doing today? Hello, Holly. It's good to be chatting to you again in the new year. It's really good. Yes, it is. I've been waiting to uh, read your book. I've had it on my list for so long. I'm glad that I finally got to read it over the holidays. So as soon as I finished, I was like, I've got to get her back on the show. <laughs> So which book was this, Holly? So your book called Chasing Himalayan Dreams. Ah! Yeah. (laughs) That's my favorite. (laughs) Oh, I love the book. I loved it because it's a dream that you have for so many years and you finally fulfilled it. But before we get into 
the Himalayan dreams. Why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? I know you've been on the show a couple of times before, but some people might not have seen those episodes. So who are you, Susan? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a best-selling author, I say, and I'm also a person who loves to walk. I love to hike. The reason I love to walk is because I have to admit that I'm extremely lazy. I hate exercising. I hate going to the gym. I would rather be curled up in a corner reading a book. Now, if I did that, I would be the size of a house. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have to exercise. And the only exercise I like is to walk. So one day I thought, why don't I just keep walking? And so I wanted to see how many days I could walk for. And <laughs> that's why I started the long hikes. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a good plan. <laughs> it's also extremely good once you reach a certain age, you can start walking and you can walk and you can leave your housework behind and your responsibilities and all the really boring parts, essential parts of your life, like keeping your house tidy or keeping your garden weeded. <laughs> <just go> <laughs> I like that. Avoiding life's responsibilities. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. I think, yeah, there's too much of that keeping a perfect house. And the other thing about hiking is you don't have to look perfect. You know, especially nowadays with social media, you have to look good. And you have to do <laughs> your Instagram and your TikTok. And, and you have to always at least look reasonable. Whereas when you're hiking and walking, you can't, I mean, you're just like a wild woman without makeup. <laughs> People expect you to be sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the book that we're here to discuss today is called Chasing Himalayan Dreams. And it's about a dream that you had for 40 years and finally fulfilled. So what was this dream and why was it so important to you? Well, you see, I was a military brat. So I grew up in a series of really small military cantonments across the north of India, you know, really burning hot in summer and freezing cold in winter and absolutely flat, almost absolutely flat. But occasionally my father would get posted to a hill station like Kashmir when I was really young. And it was like going into paradise or into a different world, literally from these steaming hot plains of, of India, North India. And eventually what happened was that because finally had to go to boarding school and hostels, because obviously to keep my education going, I couldn't move every six months. And I went to first year of university in Darjeeling. And that's where I fell in love with the mountains over there because it was so gorgeous. The mountains just take you out of yourself. At the same time, it shows you how insignificant you are. And at the same time, you feel as if you're at one with these magnificent giants of the earth. So I just love that. And unfortunately, when you're 16 years old, you have to take permission from everyone to do everything. We were not allowed to go out and hike and trek because the, it would be the guys who, you know, because we were now in uni, we were allowed to go. We would meet boys. boys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and these guys would say, oh, you girls are, you know, you're allowed. We go and we climb the peaks. We go on long hikes. But you can't do it and stuff. And of course, we of, of course we can do it. And of course, we couldn't because you weren't allowed to. So it's <laughs> very infuriating for us. <laughs> so for someone who's not familiar with Darjeeling in that area, what is it like? Well, Darjeeling, it's in that little part of northeast India. It's not really eastern India yet. It's where India meets Nepal and Tibet. So literally, when you walk along this trail, which I did, you're walking on the border of India and Tibet. And literally when you reach Sandakfu, you can see in the distance, you can see Everest. So you can see Nepal. And further than that, further than Kanchenjunga, you can look into the plateaus of Tibet. So literally standing there and you're seeing four countries. So it's, it's sort of quite amazing. And, you know, the Himalayas sweep down from the west of India, you know, starting off in Afghanistan. And they come down in this amazing arc over the north of India, and they finally peter out over the top of Burma and into the western part of China, into the Zequan provinces over there. So we are at that eastern end of the Himalayas, where the Himalayas are just the high Himalayas, which people are used to, are sort of ending, and they're just going off into northeast India and heading towards China, as it were. But at this one juncture where you sit, 
where you stand, you peaks are like, you're standing at 4,000 meters and you're looking at one shot, you're looking at about, I think four of the highest peaks in the world. So for people, if you don't want to go and mountaineer and climb Everest, it's pretty good to stand there and look at the mountain. Mm. And there are a lot of kind of ethical considerations to climbing Everest now because there are so many tour companies that get you there and and it seems to be overcrowded. And I keep reading things that's just not, if you care about the land, it's probably not a place you want to go considering how overcrowded it's become. Yeah, you can't really have an, I mean, I don't want to say that you can't have an experience there, but if you want to experience the mountains and if you want to experience the Himalayas, you want to experience the different cultures, it's much better to go on a walk like in Sandakfu or to go to Sikkim or even go to the lower parts of Nepal, because that's where you really get into the mountains and you feel what's going on. And as you say, nowadays, there's so much of ecological degradation going on. I think it's good when you walk, okay, you have to fly to get there or you have to drive to get to a point, but at least when you're doing the hike, you're just walking and you're not polluting the atmosphere. And for me, it's really important because we stay in the local villages. We don't stay in, you know, you stay in local people who are running, this is their livelihood. So you're giving them a reason to stay on the land. And I always, and I think I make a point in all my books is, I don't carry my own backpack. I don't do budget. I hire coolies. I hire the mules because it's their country. It's their mountains. Let's give back to them. So quite often I do say to people, if you can afford to get onto a plane or get onto a train and get onto a bus and go there, don't try and do a budget thing because it's stupid, isn't it? You should be spending in the place which you love and which you want to see. So that's why it's kind of, I won't get on my high horse about it, but really, if you're going to these beautiful areas, support the people and support the country by your lightest footprint and walking is the best way for you and for the environment and for the people around you. Mm, Yeah. And I think there's so much publicity about budget travel and how to save money. And I think a lot of people are so stuck in that mindset that they forget that it is important to support the local economy, the local people, especially in places that are so, so remote like this. One of the things which, uh, you know, there are some things which you read about and you know about them, like they say, you know, trafficking of women. You read about this, you know about this. When you go there, you see what it really is, because I know we walked into a little tea shop to have tea on the way. And there was this huge board, there was this huge poster telling people to report if they saw any people coming and offering to take their daughters and get them jobs. Right? It was a big poster with saying, call this number, do not send your daughters there. And really, when we were talking to the people, it was amazing that all the farmers in that area, because most of the people are farmers, they are dairy farmers or cows or sheep, they're all women because all the men have gone to the cities to work and the whole thing is is women and yeah a lot of very sad things happen over there and you can prevent that by happening if as tourists if as hikers we go there and the economy improves to such a state that you know people have enough money they're not obliged to sell their children yeah 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 and that's awful and that's something that i think a lot of people don't think about they don't realize the realities of of that part of the world And we don't realize it as well. You know, we just think it's a good place to go and have a fulfill your dream as well. But why not in fulfilling your dream as you try and fulfill someone else's dream as well? My dream might have been to walk to Sandak Fu when I was 16, but quite likely there are mothers there who want to see their daughters reach 16 at home and stay with them. And if we can help them do that, it's really wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... Tell us about this place. Tell us about Kanchenjunga and Sandakfu. What are these places? Yeah, so Sandakfu is just the point on the Singalila Ridge. So the Singalila Ridge is a ridge. And as I said, literally, the path is on the top of it. And what's this? Okay, to the left is Nepal and to the right is India, right? And as you walk along this, you crisscross between the two countries all the time. And obviously, it's not guarded. I mean, it is guarded. And there is heavy protection 
but the heavy protection there is mostly for the wildlife and the plants, right? You have quite a heavy protection there. So because there are plants over there which are so valuable that they don't want anyone to stamp on them because if you stamp on them and kill them, those plants may go extinct because they take like 40 years to grow. So there's heavy protection for that. But when you're walking along, you really don't feel any any of that stress that you're actually on the border of two countries. You just crisscross between the two countries and you might spend one night in Nepal and the next night in India. So it really shows you how artificial borders are because people on both sides look exactly the same, eating exactly the same food. But I do have to say that Indian part is a national reserve forest. It is protected. So you can literally see that the Indian part is heavily green. Their forests, it's protected. It is the original type, the Nepal type. No, it's pretty bare. People are farming over there. They've cut down all the trees and stuff. So you kind of can see it. It's a bit sad. But okay, so you walk along the Singalila Ridge and at 4,000 meters, you come to this one point called Sandak Fu, at which you can see this range of mountains called the Sleeping Buddha. It literally looks like, especially when the, when they snowfall there, because mostly, certainly when I was there, even lately, it was always full of snow the whole year. So it's like this, this white figure of a white man sleeping across the mountains. That's what's called the Sleeping Buddha. So they're all the different mountains. And of course, the highest point, tummy of the Buddha, is Kanchenjunga. So Kanchenjunga has actually been a, a sacred mountain for the indigenous people of that area from pre-Buddhist times even. And later, it's a sacred mountain and people are not encouraged to climb it ever. It's in Sikkim. People are not encouraged to climb it ever because it is also very treacherous. And from that point, it's quite amazing because they seem to float. Because of the snow cover, it seems to float over the earth. It really is, you feel as if you're in the presence of the divine, regardless of what religion or no religion you are in. So at that point, when you stand at Sandak Fu, and even a little before it, you can see the sleeping Buddha, and way over to the west, you can actually see Everest. Okay, you can see Everest over there, and that is right. So you have this entire sweep of the western Himalaya, where you can see all these mountains, which are really, really something to see. And as you say, why do you want to walk on Everest when you can just look at it <laughs> <laughs> and, and enjoy it? And so Sandak Fu is quite, I think now there is a road going up there. So, you know, you need a four-wheel drive and you can, there's a fairly good road to go up. But when you go trekking, you can go off the road into the smaller parts so that you're not on the road. But it is not a busy road because you can't have trucks on it. The bane of Indian roads. We just have. <laughs> People do go up, and but we didn't. Yeah, we took a mule train which carried our backpacks, and we went up that way. So of course, the mule train with the coolies would they would walk up in like no time at all where we were walking. <laughs> <laughs> it's high altitude as well, so you have to take it easy. It's quite hard. Mm. What were the logistics of this trip? It was a loo. Am I correct? It was, took three days to come up and two days to come down? Yeah, yeah. We went up in a loop and we took a very, the whole total, I think it was about just under 70 kilometers walk over five days. Doesn't seem much, but yeah, when you get up to 3,000 meters, like Darjeeling is at about just under 2,000 meters. So it's quite reasonable. But when you start climbing from up there, it is very quickly to, you know, you, I know I start getting altitude sickness from 2,500 meters, which may be about 8,000 feet. So you start struggling, struggling, meaning you have to walk very slowly. And I know the local guide who we had, he said, look, the way the mountain people do it is they don't stride and stomp. They take small steps slowly, literally almost a shuffle Take small steps slowly and you will reach there. So we tend to walk fast. You know, slow down, slow down, walk slowly. So that was a lot of the trick of it. And that being said, the mountain people who were there, they seem to be walking at super speeds. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're used to it. <laughs> I guess so, they're used to it. Yeah. <laughs> so how many kilometers were you walking per day? Not more than 15 kilometers a day. I think that was the longest time. Mostly it was 10 to 12. So that was the average which we climbed 
but we were climbing a lot, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's why I'm everything asking. Was, yeah, everything was vertically uphill, and except, of course, when we were coming downhill, which was <laughs> but it was quite a stiff climb. So you leave Darjeeling. So we, we kind of left Darjeeling and we started from a place called Dhotre. So from Dhotre, we went up and you go up to Tonglu or Tumling from where you get your first views of, get your first views of Kanchenjunga. So you have these two twin villages. Tonglu is in India and Tumling is in Nepal. So that's your first night halt. From there, you keep walking and you come to a place called Kayakata. Right. So while you're walking to Kayakata on that ridge, it's quite nice. You just on the, you climb up to the top of the ridge and you amble along happily thinking, oh, this is not very difficult. It's lovely undulating countryside. And then, of course, you come to this place called Kayakata. And over there, it is switchback after switchback after switchback. <laughs> and you get ascend really fast. Then you get to the top of the ridge. And then again, it's not too bad. And you think, oh, it's not too bad. But of course, by that time, you're so high up that it is, you are struggling. So you need to be aware of all these things. And I find a lot of people take altitude sickness very casually. They think that, oh, I'm tough. I can do it. I'm fit. I'm young. I can do it. It's got nothing to do with anything. Altitude sickness is just about oxygen and it can hit anyone anytime. So I did struggle a lot on that with the altitude because I thought I was 16. <laughs> silly me. Yeah, silly me. So that was the problem. So you get to Sandakfu on the third day, and that's just, I know the guide was saying, today's only eight kilometers. Yeah, but those eight kilometers still took us half the Vertical kilometers. <laughs> yeah, it took us a long time. It wasn't too vertical except at the end, but it was at that stage, what happens is even on a sunny day, you have a lot of mist can come in and that kind of slows you down because you can't see. You have to be aware of it, but it's all part of, it's really part of the experience walking at that height and you have to be aware of it. One of the things when you walk long distance, I think one of the things which is you realize your vulnerability and you're not that tough, are you? <laughs> you're actually quite fragile, right? Because you're aware of every breath you take, especially when you're in the mountains and it isn't too much air. <laughs> so that's what I like. It kind of brings you, you may go up to the mountains, brings you down to earth and you learn humility. Sometimes forget in modern life, you know, we've got all these gadgets, we've got everything. We think we are very great, but in fact, so you sort of learn to be humble in the face of the mountain. And that's probably, you know, that's probably good. Sometimes you want to just lie down. Let me just lie down in the ditch and die. I cannot walk anymore. <laughs> so where were you staying along this route? It sounded like you were staying in these really lovely little local homes and places. Yeah, they call them tea houses. Mm -hmm. You have two options. Some people, if you go with some uh, tour operators, they set up tents en route for you and you can stay in tents. But we went in the winter. So I wasn't too keen on staying in the tents, even though right. on a previous trek, we had stayed in tents and it, it wasn't too bad. But I think I prefer to stay in the tea houses again because of the height and also, you know, okay, we don't know how cold it would be or how windy it would be because you're on the ridge most of the nights. When it's good weather, it's beautiful. But if you get a storm, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. So that's why I said, okay, we'll stay in the, they're called tea houses. They're actually like, when you're on the Camino, they're like your little, not albergues, but like your hostels. You know, you definitely get a private room. And they, they have the kind of the common dining room or the lounge where they cook. There's a kitchen they cook over there or they you can cook and you can meet other people very all very nice and it's not posh it's not luxury but it's comfortable it's clean you have toilets yeah that's nice <laughs> you have toilets that's very very exciting to have toilets so yeah so how did you organize this trip you used a tour operator didn't you or a travel agency or something i looked at it and i thought booking all these places would be difficult because it was winter, not everything could be open. So I was a bit worried about that. So then we decided to go with the tour. A friend of mine 
suggested a tour operator. Actually, we had been with this tour operator before, White Magic. So at the end, when my sons finished school here in Australia, what happens is normally all the kids go for something called schoolies. They go for this big bash up session you know, freak at, in the Gold Coast where they drink and dance and do music and stuff like that. <laughs> so I said, okay, and my, my sons were not so keen on that anyway. They, were, they are not party animals. So I said, okay, you finish school, let's go to India. And we went on a Himalayan trek then. And that was quite a complicated trek because we wanted to go to a forest. We wanted to see tigers. We wanted to do whitewater rafting. We wanted to do trekking. We wanted to do a bit of camping under the stars. And we did all that. So to do all that, it was too complicated. We went with someone called White Magic and it was perfect. So when we said we we're going to Sandak Fu, I said, why not ask them? And also we went with them. There was nobody else on that trip. It was only us. <laughs> it <isn't> good. <laughs> <laughs> we went like this entourage of four mules and a cook. <laughs> a guide and everything it was great fun very very royal <laughs> it sounded but we like still it had to walk. oh yeah exactly <laughs> we still had to walk and it was good we had a good time we could talk to the guys and they would explain stuff to us and what do you like to eat and you know what the worst thing about altitudes is you lose your appetite i lost my appetite and they would be saying what do you want to make we'll cook anything for you I can't eat. I'm so I'm not hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and did you take medication for altitude sickness on this trip? Because I know you have another one. I was very silly, Holly. I didn't realize. On the first time we went on the Himalayan trek, I was a little uncomfortable for a couple of nights. My main discomfort was that I can't sleep at altitudes. That's one of the things of altitude sickness. So I thought, yeah, I'll be so tired. We'll be doing so much of walking. I'll be able to sleep. And even if I can't sleep, it's okay. But because this trek was all at high altitudes, I was quite tired and uncomfortable and it was quite difficult. So I didn't take Diamox and never again. The next when I went to the Valley of Flowers, I took the Diamox. And then no mucking around taking the Diamox. And I did that. But I would recommend everyone, definitely, you must take the Diamox, however healthy and fit and young you think you are. And like literally we had, I'm not sure whether it was this walk or the Valley of Flowers walk, we had youngsters like in their 20s who were so tough, you know, walking ahead of us. And then we'd meet them in the night and they were going down saying, we can't deal with it. We, we, they had to give up and walk, go down because they couldn't go. Um, we even heard of people who actually died because they didn't. And these guys were, <laughs> they were quite fit and young and they had done it before and they had not realized it. So apparently uh, if you get really sick, get high altitude sickness there's not much you can do so no mucking around if you're going on a high altitude trek take the diamox and don't rush up which is why we could have got up there it was only about 35 kilometers to walk up but i said no we're going to take we took three full days to walk up two nights on the road yeah two nights on the road and then we walked up and from my experience Next time at Valley of Flowers, I would say, if you know that you've got altitude sickness, you probably need to slow it down even more. <laughs> because if you don't want to take medication, then spend two nights at each place and do it that way. And, and have a good time spending two nights in a place. You can rest, relax, enjoy the areas around and then continue walking. The point is not just to walk. The point is also to enjoy the area. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what is the best time of year to visit? I was really surprised that you went up into the mountains in December just because it seems like that would be the harshest time of the year to visit. You have to know the geography of the area. So what happens is in December, you are almost guaranteed a size, a site of the Sleeping Buddha. Any other time of the year, you can go up there and you may not see anything. It will be cloudy. So what happens is that by about... August, the monsoons start boiling up. And of course, the monsoons is the hot air rising from the plains of India. And they come and they hit the Himalayas, immediately condense and create clouds, which then go back and water the plains of India. So it's because of the monsoon. So from about August to October, it's no use going there because you will not see anything. It's just clouds because that's what the roughy of the area is. And sometimes if your monsoon is late, this can go into November, right? 
Like we have had monsoon. Like last year, we were having landslides in November in that area nearby. Not in Sandakfu, but nearby areas. Because the monsoon was kind of late. So if the monsoon is late, like generally the monsoon is supposed to hit uh, Bombay in June, early June. And then it progressively hits other places like North India. It will start hitting North India in July. And then further west, it will hit in August. So by the time you reach the foothills of the Himalayas in the east where you start walking up, it's August. And the monsoon is now going to continue till certainly till October, peters out in October. So normally by the end of October, you can start seeing the, the mountains again because the clouds are petering out. But you can still have post-monsoon storms. And of course, because it's been summer, you may not see much snow on the mountains in October, November. So you wait for the snow to fall. And apparently nowadays it's falling later. I've seen pictures of people who've gone in, in December and not been much snow on the mountains, really. Not as, yeah. So people, I think I was seeing a picture the other day of some guys walking in the Himalayas and they're having a lot of heavy snowfall now. They're having lots of snow now. Yeah. So what will happen is, of course, if you get up there now, you could probably see snow. But again, if it's snowing, there'll be clouds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're kind you of, you this can never plan. <laughs> There's this little dance you're doing, but December was not so bitterly cold. And I think because of whatever's happening, I was actually in India in December. I was in Lucknow where I grew up and went to school. And we used to have really bitter winters there. 11 degrees in the night and 25 degrees in the day. And I said, what is this? I'm being cheated. I oh, come wow. from Australia. I want a cold winter. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I believe it's cold now. So it's really cold, bitterly cold now. So I would reckon the other time to do this walk is in March and April. So March and April, by the end of April, what, what happens is that the flowers start blooming and the hillsides are covered, are red with rhododendron. And you have all the beautiful Himalayan flowers which is the reason why people went to Sandakfu. You had, I don't know if you've heard of Booker. He was a botanist from the UK in, in colonial times. He came and he was the guy who actually opened up these trails because he was searching for plants. He was searching for all these beautiful plants, the rhododendron and the camellia and the gardenia, all these plants which now grace English gardens. They all came from here, from Darjeeling and and Sandakfu and Kanchenjunga, all those plants. So he was one of the first explorers of those areas, thick bamp, hacking through the forests and going up there. And a lot of the early mountaineers also were, they created these trails because they wanted to see these places because these places are not inhabited. They, there are not many people there, just are very small and tiny because it's mostly a little bit of subsistence farming and maybe sheep and goats, but nothing else. And now, of course, there's tourism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what are your top tips for someone who's maybe never been to this part of the world, never done such a remote trip like this, but they want to visit this area? How should they go about it, aside from reading your book? Well, I would definitely say read my book, read anything else. Also, try and definitely travel with a tour operator. Or a... The other thing is that the local government of Darjeeling, you know, the district. Darjeeling and Sandakfu is in West Bengal, which is, this area is North Bengal, and they have like an autonomous kind of region. They have slightly different rules to the rest of West Bengal. You know, the language there is not Bengali, it's Nepali, and the people there have a, an autonomous region. So you cannot go to Sandakfu unless you hire a local guide from Kalpokri. So you have to have a local guide, and this is one of the reasons is, of course, for a tourism, support the economy, and also it's to ensure that people don't get lost and wander off into Nepal or Tibet and cross there, and also don't pluck the plants and damage the plants. That area is, you also have the red panda there. There's a red panda breeding program, which is one of the few areas where they are actually successfully been trying to breed the red panda Red pandas, it's a very rare, rare animal. So that is one area also. So there's no, you know, you can't touch any of the wildlife in that area. So definitely my tips would be make your base in Darjeeling. 
even if you're just going in, Darjeeling has been on the Western tourist trail for many years. So Darjeeling's well set up. You can find guides there. You can find tour guides there or everyone is online now. So definitely try and look for a guide who will use the local facilities and definitely take a guide and give yourself enough time. Give yourself enough time. Don't try and rush up. Sometimes people try and rush you up saying, oh, you can do it in two days. You can just drive up there. That's not the point. Right? So, <laughs> uh, definitely give yourself time. Don't believe that there's no, or, no such thing as altitude sickness. So give yourself time to enjoy it because there's a lot of things to enjoy. The other thing which you could do is to try and avoid the festival season, which is the Bali and Puja season in Bengal, because you'll have quite a few crowds then because people come up from Calcutta. So try and avoid that time, which is why December is a good time. Because otherwise, October, November, if you get caught in the Diwali, the Sera, you could get quite a lot of crowds over there. I mean, there'll be more rush in the tea houses. So we went with a full tour package, as it were. But you could go with a single guide and eat along the way. But definitely still be careful so that your tummy doesn't get out. Because uh, you need to be aware of those things because those pathogens are quite can be quite strong. So when you're staying in the tea houses and stuff, definitely be careful about that. But apart from that, you can get everything else. So if you fall sick anywhere, there's a road. So there are land cruisers or jeeps which go up and down all the time. And you can get one of those and you can get out easily. It's not a drama. You get out of there if you fall sick, which is what I find people are worried about but uh, you will not find the crowds of western tourists there so mm, in a way nice. that's good because it's in north india in the eastern and in the mountain areas it's very safe for women very safe you don't get any of the out of the harassment which you can sometimes get in other parts of india north india you don't get any of this here people are quite respectful of course you still have to be sensible about things but you don't get that endemic so it's quite safe for women and if I could do it at 60 and anyone can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I have chronic asthma and oh, so yeah, I. I have uh, all those issues, but none of it matters. Right? One step at a time slowly and it's okay. And I guess if you like to see mountains and if you have any interest at all in the Himalayas and in mountains, it's something amazing in that juncture of culture and geography and spirituality, it all kinds of comes together in this enormous kaboom, which is Kanchanjunga, <laughs> which is false. And for women, it was the home of the goddess who threw lightning. You know, every time there's a storm, they say the goddess annoyed with you and throwing lightning darts at you. So it's very sci-fi-ish as well, very exciting. <laughs> there's something for everyone. <laughs> So I think I know the answer to this question, but did the reality of the trip fulfill your expectations? Because this had been a dream for so long. Were you, was it all you had hoped? Sometimes the honest opinion is when you're actually walking, you think, am I insane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> am I crazy to do this? And really on the way, because at the last minute, I wasn't too well. And my husband was saying, shall we go down? I don't think you should continue. And I said, I, I thought to myself, I'm going to die, but I'm going to finish this. <laughs> and yes, it was totally worth it because there's this point, you, you know, you keep walking and it seems as if it's never getting closer. And suddenly you literally go, come around this bend and there's the whole sleeping Buddha just standing in front of you. And it's one of those moments where you literally have to just stop and stare and literally stay with your mouth open in a very inelegant fashion. And if we were blessed that we had a beautiful day, we literally, it was one in the afternoon, the sun was shining and we just came out and this boom. Sometimes these visual experiences are so stunning that, you know, you can't do anything. It's a lot like walking into Santiago after you walk in and you just stand in front of the cathedral. And however many times you've seen it, it just kind of, hits you and it's then that you realize that I don't really believe in that the destination doesn't matter it's the journey I think the destination think matters <laughs> for me I think you know you just walk around and you realize why you've seen that and if it's something which has been hanging around in your subconscious or being there for so long 
when you finally do it, it's kind of you've got closure on a lot of things, not just that you wanted to do this, you get closure on a lot of issues in your life. Like I'm a girl, like what we had, I'm a girl, I can't do this. Mm. That kind of sense. Yeah. It gets kind of just put to bed immediately and people like, oh, it's too dangerous. You won't. It's not dangerous, right? It's more dangerous crossing the road outside your house. Quite yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of those fears get put away. And I think in that you have growth. And it's the old story, Holly. You've got to get out of your comfort zone if you want to do anything. And you can't get out of your comfort zone unless you're uncomfortable on the way there. And when you reach there, it, kind of, it hits you and you realize that you've done. Yes, I've done it. The terrible uphill is over. Okay. <laughs> so there's a bit of that. Yeah, yeah. But there's also, we kept getting up and going out and looking at it again and again. Like, I think we went to the room and to our stuff, all right, and we just couldn't stay there. We had to keep coming out and looking at it from different angles. We might have missed something in this huge mountain. We just said 180 degrees and I might have missed something. <laughs> But yeah. that's also the whole way we met people because we were walking at each place, we met people and we were talking to them. And you know, you read about the schoolboys who we met on the way, and they were we were so ancient. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it was really good, but to see them, and I was thinking, this is like those horrible boys of who used to say, Oh, y'all are not good enough, we can climb up over there. And I was thinking, yeah, this is like a <laughs> These are the same guys. They were so sweet, those fellows. They were so nice and polite and lovely. And, and of course, I made them think, why haven't your sisters come? Yes. Where are your classmates who are girls? And of course, I told them the story of why I was there. I wasn't allowed. And you know, one of them said, oh, we will allow our daughters to climb and we will tell our sisters to climb. So that's how you make change. Yeah, lovely. That's how you how you you seed it in the minds yes. of people. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today and talking about your Himalayan dreams. Where can people find your book online and purchase it? It's on Amazon, mm -hmm. on Amazon.com. That's the only place you can get it. But it's a, it's a book and it's a print book and an ebook, and it's easily available over there. And that's really the best place. It's in all the stores in uh, com au india uk in, it's available in all the stores and you'll get it with a click yes excellent i would say take the kindle and read it if you like otherwise get the book and read it you know some people like to have a book whatever you like <laughs> mm. now you have a new book coming out on the winter camino can you tell us a little bit about that yes you're reminding me i am in the midst of that different type of Camino writing the book. So <laughs> we did the, it's called the Camino Invierno, which is, means the winter Camino. And it's what medieval pilgrims would do if they couldn't stop in Ponferrada and spend a month or two there waiting for the terrible snows to get over. And they would loop down. So the path loops down south from the Camino Frances and skirts the mountains and then goes to Santiago. So that being said, it's still mountainous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't miss the high mountains. I mean, I guess you miss the high mountains. But that was the Camino in Vierno. And it was really good because there's, a lot, there's still a lot of history on it. You've got lovely towns. The winter Camino means we should do it in winter. But apparently, I don't know, people do it in summer as well because it was an adventure of a different kind because in November, everything was closed. So, of course, we had pre-booked stays and we had to pre-book. And I think most of the albergues were closed, but we stayed in hotels, including one or two luxury hotels. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but it was wet. It rained. I had to wear a very unflattering, bright orange poncho. <laughs> but it was wet. It was cold. It was utterly, utterly beautiful. I cannot tell you how beautiful it was. And there were no people. Some stages were very remote and very isolated. And of course, it has commits the terrible, terrible sin of there being no cafe con leche. Mm. It's terrible. But uh, what are we to do? But it was still, uh, I think I read somewhere that the Camino in Vierno is what the Camino Frances was 25 years ago. So again, coming back to that theme of humility, you realize to do a pilgrimage, you really need to be humble. And boy, that 
Camino Invierno Humble Zero. Yeah. But it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Oh, lovely. Beautiful. We should really call it the fall Camino in December. Mm, yeah. Because it had these colors were where we had, it's the wine growing region from Pont Ferrara up to Montfort. It was so beautiful, Holly. You can't believe it. The colors. Sometimes I just wanted to sit down and cry um, in the rain. Yeah. With the beauty. <laughs> with the <laughs> <And> orange poncho. <laughs> in my orange poncho. Nobody would have known who I was. Yeah. Nobody could see who I was. Yeah. But it was uh, challenging. Got 200 and same story. The Brearley miles. Don't believe it. It says it's 250. It's at least 300. <laughs> So when is the book coming out? I'm hoping for April. April, nice. Yeah, as usual. I'm having these doubts, Holly, because some people are saying they're tired of the step-by-step, day-by-day type of talk. But I don't know. I think for something which is so new, I think I have to do the stages, right? In all my books, I put in enough stories and personal stuff in between to keep you entertained. This book will be more, less of a guidebook and it'll be more like Chasing Himalayan Dreams, which is really, it's a memoir because the important thing about it is that I went with friends. So I went with friends from India. So we've known each other for 30, 35 years. You know, we have a Catholic, an atheist and a Hindu walking the Camino and arriving at Santiago together. Yeah, what days I became the instant theologian to tell them what the story, but why are we walking? Why did they kill Jesus? And I'm thinking... <laughs> This is a Camino. I'm walking by my giving theology lessons. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, really, I don't know what the Pope would say if he heard me. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess we all are qualified to share our faith and to share our beliefs. And really, we're not that different. And everyone is on the pilgrimage. We are all seeking the divine or seeking something greater than us which is also what we do in the Himalayas. Lovely. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your experiences. I really look forward to your new book and I encourage anyone to read your book about chasing Himalayan dreams. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Holly. Lovely to talk to you. Please drop me a line and let me know what you thought of this week's episode. You can email me at holly at hollywharton.com or find me online and get in touch. If you enjoyed this episode, you might want to check out these related episodes. 490, I ask the question, how bad do you want it? And I talk about finding motivation for your adventures. 480, I talk about making your adventures non-negotiable. 45, I speak with Marie-Pierre Tremblay about how to go after big dreams and adventures, even when you think it's impossible. And again, 403 and 391 are with Susan Jagannath. One of them is the Adventures on the Camino Inglés, that's 403. And episode 391 is Hiking the Valley of Flowers in the Himalayas. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And next week, I will be back with another exciting guest. In the meantime, remember to visit hollywharton.com forward slash 498 for the show notes on this episode. Happy trails to you. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed at hollywharton.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-R-T-O-N.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.